Now just go. Oh. What? Do it, man. Oh. 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 Yeah. You better now, man. Yeah. You better? Yeah. Feel all right, huh? And hope everybody's mellow this morning. KBYP back in the saddle to explain the last part of the matching network, the fake tuner thing. I've left one gaping hole and one glowing air. So far, I've approached this as <clears throat> the fact that it's absolutely critical to have a properly matched antenna and not play with matching devices. There's a tremendous difference in antenna performance getting it right. I get it. In a few cases, it's a problem. But in amateur radio, with multiple bands, we've always got the option if the yard's too small to go to a higher band to make a proper antenna. Or make several. What's a dipole cost? 20 bucks? Well, I've explained recently that, that this thing about reflected power from an antenna coming back to the transmitter and being reflected against a myth and I've shown evidence of that it revolves around the transmission line coupling back into the transmitter if it was initially coupled correctly from a 50 ohm transmitter to a 50 ohm line then it's going to be the same condition coming backwards and I've stated that Putting a matching network in at any value except 50 in and 50 out causes a mismatch that limits forward power. And one of our viewers has shown staggering evidence of that with a upwards of a 5 dB loss, maybe a little more, by using a fake tuner to, to play the touching up game. Yeah, it touched all right. It touched about 5 dB off his signal performance, and you wouldn't think it, but it did. Well, I've tried to, to keep this simple, and that leaves a problem. Because amateur radio is not about operating radio equipment. Anybody can do that. Amateur radio is supposed to be kind of like commercial broadcast engineering to operate, maintain, and adjust radio stations. Everything. This brings the observation that, that this thing about the transmission line always being matched to the transmitter or receiver was not always true. Was not in the past necessarily true. <clears throat> my, my comments that the line is always matched and there's no reflection of the transmitter is in the context of of us today with modern radio equipment that doesn't exist. But like Spock said in Star Trek, myths usually have a basis in fact, and this one does. In fact, there used to be a case for that. There used to be a case where it would admit the possibility or the fact of that reflected energy again being reflected at the transmitter because of an impedance mismatch. And the difference came in time around the 1970s and 80s with the advent of computers. Well, computers aren't radio devices. What's that got to do with it? It's got everything to do with it. In the early days of radio, the 1910s up to roughly the 1970s, legacy. <clears throat> this might be the first RF amplifier in a receiver. Or point to triangle backwards and you got the last, the final amplifier in a transmitter. And matching might have been done with the series LC circuit. Inductor and variable capacitor. <clears throat> that capacitor can be adjusted to change the resonant frequency of that network. And that will couple the generator on the left to the amplifier on the right. <clears throat> and in theory, when that's resonant, then 
there's the most signal delivered from the source to the amplifier. That gave selectivity. That's especially good when there are strong signals out of band that can overload that first RF amplifier. This kind of thing was a thing back before we had the concept of automatic gain control. Back before circuits were complex like that. Back in the tune plate, tune grid days. And what that was referred to or associated with was something called pre-select. My first amateur rig, big knob on the upper right. Pre-select control. That adjusted very poorly to put a single receiver front end on various frequencies for various bands. Drake R4A. Pre-selector. Manually adjust the coupling between stages for various frequencies. Drake TR3. The knob beside the two red eyes. RF tune is a pre-selector. Above it, the plate and the load are a, if you will, a post-selector between the RF final amplifier and the transmission line. The plate and the load and the coil we can't see, which is not adjustable, are a matching network. Those are made of, all these circuits are made of discrete, discrete lumped constant components. Lumped constant means each component has a constant value and they are lumped together in a network and a function with an image at each end. See my matching network videos. TS430, no pre-selector. If you'll start a band scan with this rig <clears throat> and modern rigs like the Yazoo, those rigs will scan along one, two, three, five, six, eight megahertz, you'll hear a click. That's a relay switching over matching networks. But these receivers and transmitters are extremely broad banded. I can transmit over that Yesu several megahertz wide into a dummy load. Perfect match. What happened? What changed? As I mentioned in my matching as I mentioned in my matching network videos, what changed was the advent of computers that could calculate complex bandpass networks. Very complicated math. Difficult or impossible to do without computer. So today we have a source on the left as we did in the legacy case. But now, especially with advanced ferrites, we have band, broad bandpass transformers. Now the Transformer coupled into a bandpass arrangement was discussed in the Radio Engineer's Handbook in the 1940s. This was not new in the 60s. And uh, the Drake TR3 was from the 60s. The, the Heath kit was from the 70s. The R4A was from the 70s. But what's technology today and almost universally in use is a bandpass topology. The bandpass network is a complex network. And if you think the, the T matching network is complicated to calculate, try calculating a, a several order bandpass filter. It'll make you want to jump off a bridge, <laughs> take up a ream of paper. They're basically not solvable without computer. Back when there were no computers, they couldn't solve them. So the, the, the ideas behind these networks were known, but they couldn't work them. Well, now it's trivial. You get a set of uh, normalized formulas and get denormalization data. And it's so easy. There are websites online where you can calculate an eighth order butter, uh, Butterworth filter, piece of cake. Trying to build it is a different question because you'll have to monkey around with the coefficients to get values of L and C that are meaningful. <laughs> but I digress. The bandpass filter will, will have L matching sections on each end. But these modern technologies are approximately the same as a broadbanded transmission line. So in a modern context, when a transmission line looks into or from either of these, 
There's no difference. There's no impedance. These are approximately resistive at all frequencies. So the, ca the case of reflected energy from an antenna coming back to the transmitter could have been a thing 60, 60 to 80 years ago, but it is not now. And this is a horrifying mistake of using this ancient thing of matching networks, which have been around forever, on modern transmitters is an unmitigated disaster. And, and this thing is a is a not even an intergenerational thing now. It's been several generations of, of persons since since this was a thing. You know, no, nobody today sees this unless we tinker with old radios. Then it's all tune plate, tune grid, and all that. But nowadays, there's no such thing as that. It, it's all this bandpass coupled. Bandpass coupling eliminates the controls on the front panel. It eliminates the need to adjust them. Also has the benefit of in a transmitter cutting out harmonics. So uh, there is the rest of the explanation as to why, where this myth came from and why it is a horrifying, screaming ah! mistake of using this ancient technology of tuners on these new radios. You want to blow your transmitter up, go for it. Not me. KBYP did it. It's necessary to add a final point to really explain this. The, the theory is that if there's a mismatch at the antenna, energy comes back down the line, it sees as a result of a mismatch at the transmitter or receiver another reflection. That is possible in old school. But, but assume initially the transmitter, transmission line and antenna are all matched. Now change the frequency of the transmitter. Now this lump constant network is mismatched. Its component values didn't change, but its impedance changed because impedance is a function of frequency. So there is an impedance mismatch, but that limits how much power the transmitter can send forward. There's a loss in forward power already. That energy goes up the line. The antenna that was matched at the, at the correct frequency is now mismatched at the feed point. Not because the antenna changed, but because the frequency changed. That causes reflection. That energy is coming back down the line. The line doesn't care what the energy is. The line is 50 ohms always because of its dimensions. It can't change. But that energy sees that mismatched network, which now instead of the transmitter output or receiver input appearing to be 50 ohm resistive, there is an impedance there. Different R, some kind of X value. That does constitute the conditions for a reflection at the original end of the transmission line. But see, playing this game, you've already shot yourself in the foot three times. It isn't worth playing. And again, that only applies to this antique technology. That does not apply to bandpass coupling as a rule. So there's there's the, the frosting on the uh, the cake of the of the whole explanation, did it?